Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is great to see each of you this afternoon. And I trust that your life is one that magnifies our God. Our God has blessed us so richly. What a beautiful day we've had today. But we trust that this is a beautiful time also as we have gathered to study from the Word of God. And tonight I want to talk to you about a story. It's a story about Jesus, but it's actually couched in a series of stories about Jesus. If you would, at this time, turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 8 and 9. Matthew chapter 8. And what we're going to see here is that Matthew presents us with a series of extraordinary events about Jesus, even miraculous events. And they happen in this order. As you look at the beginning of Matthew chapter 8, you see Jesus healing a leper. And then you see him healing the centurion's servant. And then it is Peter's mother-in-law that is healed of a terrible fever. And then as they leave that house in Capernaum, as they go across the sea, a great storm comes up and Jesus saves all the men in the boat as he calms the storm. And as they reach the eastern shore of the Mediterranean Sea, there Jesus is met with two men who are demon-possessed, and Jesus cast out the demons. Five miracles in consecutive order in Matthew chapter 8. And then as you move into Matthew chapter 9, you see another series of miracles. You see Jesus first forgiving a man's sin and then healing that man of his paralyzed condition. Following that, there's a girl restored to life, and then there's an elderly woman who is healed of a chronic disease, and then Jesus heals two blind men, and then Jesus comes across a man who cannot speak, and Jesus heals him of that mute condition that he had. This series of ten miracles consumes these two chapters. It's just one miracle on top of another. And why would Matthew group all these together? It's like Matthew is saying, I want you to see this man and his power because he is powerful. And he works miracles of various sorts. They're not all healings. Some casting out demons. Some taking control of nature. Matthew wants us to see these ten miracles as a demonstration of the power of Jesus. And why? Because he wants us to understand who Jesus is, that indeed he is the Son of God. But I would ask you, and I wish we had time to do this and just kind of go around the room and ask you, which of these dramatic events do you find to be the most significant? I will tell you, I lean toward the calming of the sea You remember that story, they're out there in the boat and Jesus is asleep and this terrible storm comes sweeping down across the Mediterranean, or uh, across the the Sea of Galilee. I mentioned the Mediterranean, that's a different sea. You know that. Comes sweeping down across the Sea of Galilee and the disciples in the boat are afraid. They think they're going to die. And they said to Jesus, do you not care that we perish? They waken Jesus. And he spoke to the wind, and then he spoke to the sea, and there was complete calm when Jesus did that. And you know how that story ended. The disciples said, who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? I I lean heavily toward that as the most dramatic of these stories. And yet, I look at the next one about the casting out of the demons, and I see that as one also that is a dramatic story. When he cast out the legion of demons. You read about the legion of demons in Mark chapter 5 and verse 9, where Jesus asked the question, what is your name? And the demon spoke and said, legion, for we are many. And we have no idea how many. Roman legion was very large. Don't know how large this legion of demons was. But Jesus dealt with that. He cast those out, and they went into the herd of swine. You read about that story in Matthew 8, Mark chapter 5, and also in Luke chapter 8. And I want us to read from Matthew chapter 8, and I want to begin at verse 28. Matthew 8, 28 to the end of the chapter. 
The text says, when Jesus came to the other side, to the country of the Gadarenes. Now remember, they had been over at Capernaum, and they are crossing the Sea of Galilee to go to the eastern shore. That's when this great storm had come up. And so they come to the other side, to the country of the Gadarenes, and two, two demon-possessed men met him, coming out of the tomb so fierce that no one could pass that way. And behold, they cried out, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now a herd of many pigs was feeding at some distance from them, and the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, send us away into the herd of pigs. And he said to them, He said to them, Go. And when he said, Go, they came out, and they went into the herd of pigs and behold the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters the herdsmen fled and going into the city they told everything especially what had happened to the demon possessed men and behold all the city came out to meet Jesus and when they saw him they begged him to leave their region now both mark and luke give us a more detailed account of this story not only more detailed, but they supplement a whole lot of the things that Matthew does not discuss. And it's interesting that Mark and Luke, they focus on only one of the men who were possessed with demons. You see, in Matthew, you've got the two mentioned, but Mark and Luke focus on only one. And I think the reason why is that one of these men wanted to follow Jesus after he had been healed, after the demon had been cast out. He wanted to follow Jesus and become one of the Lord's personal disciples. But what could we learn? What could we learn from this dramatic incident? What lessons should we take home from this? I think the first thing that we might take note of is of the existence of demons. And we need to understand that demons were real. Jesus always treated the demons and real, as real. In fact, he not only treated the demons as real, he treated Satan as real. He interacted with the demons in this case. And in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus interacted with Satan himself. Now you contrast Jesus with some of the modern thinkers who say, well, you know, demon possession in the Bible, that was just the way those ignorant, superstitious, ancient people dealt with mental illness. Because what demon possession was, it was just a mental illness. Now follow that logic. Because Jesus cast the mental illness out of the men, and the pigs now become mentally ill? I think there's something wrong with that. And furthermore, Jesus, truth, the man who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. This impugns him. It impugns his character. If Jesus is all that he claims to be, he cannot go along with some superstitious, ignorant view that ancient people might have had. Now, the Bible makes a clear distinction between mental illness and demon possession. But the modern thinkers, you know, they reject all the miracles that are in the Bible and say, really, all this was, was just mental illness. And that, of course, brands the Bible as a book that is untrue. And if it's untrue, then you ought not to trust it. Furthermore, there are some people who look at this event and they say, well, demons, that's just a figurative way of referring to evil. But these were not real spirits at all. And the same thing is true with Satan. When Jesus talks about Satan, he's just talking about evil, but he's not talking about some kind of a being. Once again. Jesus treated these demons and Satan as real, and he interacted with both of them. And so it's, it's a mistake to say that Jesus was only humoring the superstitions of the time. That's not the way Jesus acted. But there's a second thing I want us to see about the existence of demons, and that is they knew that their time on earth was limited. And in my judgment, this is one of the most important issues we will deal with as we talk about demon possession. And, you know, typically when we talk about demon possession, there's a multitude of questions that come up. People say, well, I have a question about this and about that. 
And so do I. I have questions about it too. And I cannot answer all the questions that people might have about demon possession, but we will try to answer a few of those questions tonight. And Matthew chapter 8 and verse 29 is a verse that will help us in understanding about demon possession. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 29. We've read the verse once, but let's read it again. When Jesus approached these men, these men cried out and said, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? This last sentence is critical. Have you come here to torment us before the time? These demons knew that their time on earth was limited. They not only knew their time on earth was limited, but they knew that Jesus had the power to cast them out, to cast them down to the abyss where they would be tormented. I'm looking at Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8 and verse 31. This is one of our other references. Remember Matthew 8, Mark 5, Luke 8. In Luke chapter 8 and verse 31. These demons begged Jesus not to command them to depart into the abyss. Your translation, instead of the word abyss, it could have the actual Greek word abusos there, or it could have the word pit. But it doesn't matter which word is used there. This is talking about a place of torment for the deacon, for the demons. They knew they, knew they were going to be cast out. They knew their time on earth was limited. And that's critical that we understand that. Matthew 8 and verse 29, along with a number of other passages, causes us to conclude that demon possession does, does not exist today. It no longer exists. Most folks, when they talk about demon possession, if they're familiar with the Bible, they say, well, demon possession has always existed. It was there in the Old Testament. It's there in the New Testament. And it's all over the world today. Demon possession still takes place. You know, there may be demonic activity, but there is no demon possession. There is no demon possession in the Old Testament. Someone says, of course there is. It's all over. No, it's just not there. And I challenge you to find a case where it talks about demon possession in the Old Testament. The closest you're going to find is in the case of King Saul, when an evil spirit from the Lord came upon him at certain times. And that evil spirit, the word spirit there is not a reference to a demon spirit, but rather it is to Saul's disposition. And every time that David played on his harp, Saul's disposition was changed. That's not a case of demon possession. It simply does not exist in the Old Testament. And yet when you come into the New Testament, you find Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and even several references in the book of Acts to demon possession. And it would appear this. It would appear that this is true, that demon possession came on the scene at about the same time that Jesus came on the scene. And Jesus had the power to cast the demons out. His apostles had the power to cast demons out. In fact, it seems that there were others who also had that power. The 70 that Jesus sent out on the limited commission, they had the power to cast out demons. In my understanding, and I'm willing to be corrected on this if I'm inaccurate, but in my understanding, demon possession was allowed by God during the period of what we call the age of miracles, while men on earth were given these miraculous powers by Jesus and by the Holy Spirit. These demons were allowed to roam. They were allowed to possess people. And you see all sorts of activity on the part of the demons. But it coincided with the age of miracles. And when, when the age of miracles ceased, demon possession also ceased. Why? Because the ability to cast out demons, which was a spiritual gift, was no longer needed because when Jesus cast the demons out, as these demons said, they realized that they would be tormented. They realized that their destiny, their eternal destiny, was the abyss. And so I would just say to us that there is no case of demon possession today. It ended with the spiritual gifts. It coincided with the age of miracles. And the question would be then, why did God allow this? Because obviously God allowed it. I think it is to do, as we see in this story in Matthew, it is to do with the power of Jesus to demonstrate that Jesus has power over the forces of Satan. That's, why I, that's what I understand to be 
reason why God would have allowed it. Now, someone may ask, and this is a commonly asked question, where did the demons come from? What's their origin? And I will be with you and just tell you that I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us the origin of the de demons. Now, someone says, well, I think they're the fallen angels, the angels that rebelled against God. And I suppose that's as good a theory as, as any other. I, I suppose that's as good a theory as any other. But again, that's speculation because the Bible does not tell us the source of these demon spirits. Some, say, some people say, well, it's the spirits of wicked, of wicked men who have died and God allows them to come back and, and, and inhabit the bodies of individuals. Again, you know, you can make all, all, signs, all sorts of theories, but the truth is the Bible does not say. And I want to say this, that when Jesus cast the demons out, that was a way of binding or prohibiting Satan. I'm looking at Luke chapter 11. Again, one of our texts, Luke chapter 11 and verses 20 to 22. And here Jesus had just cast out a demon. Uh, this actually is a little bit later in the book of Luke. Our text, of course, was Luke chapter 8. But in chapter 11 of Luke, Jesus was casting out demons again. And in this case, the men who saw it, they said, sure, he can cast out demons, but he does it by the power of Beelzebub. He's doing it by the power of Satan. That was an accusation made against him. And, of course, Jesus pointed out the folly of that accusation. In verse number 20, of Luke chapter 11, Jesus said, but if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons. In another place, he said, it is by the Holy Spirit that I cast out demons. If it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. He says, when a strong man, this is verse 21, when a strong man fully armed guards his palace, his goods are safe. Now, who is the strong man in verse 21? The strong man is none other than Satan himself. And his goods, well, that's his minions that follow him, the demons. And he says this strong man, he guards his place. He guards his possessions. And his goods are safe. But look at verse 22. When one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. And who is the stronger man? The stronger here is Jesus. Jesus is demonstrating his power over Satan. And in doing, in doing so, he is prohibiting some of Satan's activity. And it's critical that we see that, that the casting out of demons was a way of God showing, of God showing that Jesus had power over Satan. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. You've got passages like that in 1 John. You've got passages like that in the book of Hebrews. Someone says, well, Max, if you say demon possession no longer exists today, how are you going to explain the cases of possession today where people are demon possessed? And how are you going to explain the exorcisms that take place today? Because I've seen preachers on TV, they say this person is demon possessed and they, come, they say, come out foul spirit. And the demon comes out of them. What you see there is an imagined possession and an imagined exorcism. Both are imagined. One person imagines that they're possessed by a demon. You know, the, the preachers who talk about these kind of things and who tell people uh, that demon possession is alive and well today, uh, they will attribute all sorts of things to, to Satan and to the demons. They'll say, oh, this person has a blasphemy demon. He speaks against God, a blasphemy demon. Let me tell you something, my friends. No demon in the Bible ever blasphemed. They were afraid of God. They were afraid of Jesus. This person has an adultery demon. They can't help but to commit adultery because a demon possesses them and makes them commit adultery. This fellow has a, 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 an alcohol demon, has a drug demon. And what they do is they begin to attribute all kinds of sins to demon activity and demon possession. The Bible just doesn't do that. The Bible doesn't do that. 
But when people are under the power of suggestion, and the preacher keeps saying, you know, you might be possessed with a demon. Come up here on, on the stage, and, and we will cast the demon out of you. There are people who would believe that indeed they are possessed by a demon. But let me just say this. There was no doubt that these men that we're talking about were possessed with, de with demons. No doubt. It cannot be demonstrated that anyone today is possessed by a demon. And how do we know that? Well, because first of all, these demons had supernatural knowledge. Secondly, they had supernatural power. Let me show you what I mean. I'm looking at Luke chapter 8 and verse 28. And here the text says, when this man saw Jesus, of course, he's possessed by a demon, Luke 8, 28 saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. What does he know about Jesus? He knows that Jesus is the son of the most high God. Other people, they don't know who Jesus is. They're trying to figure out. But the demons have supernatural knowledge about who Jesus is. Look at the next verse, verse 29. Not only supernatural knowledge, but supernatural power. Verse 29, for he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man for many a time. It had seized him. This man was not responsible for his activity. It was the demon that had seized him. And this man was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bond and be driven by the demon into the desert. And so what had the people done? The people had banished these demon-possessed men to live among the, uh, among the graveyards, in the cemeteries, in the tombs. And they chained them with shackles. And what would the demon do? The demon imbued that person with supernatural power, and they could break the chains, break the shackles. Today, those who claim demon possession have no supernatural knowledge, and they have no supernatural power. And so I say to you, there is no such thing as demon possession that is allowed on the earth today. But I will give you this word of caution and this word of warning. Don't believe that the devil has gone out of business. It's just the demon possession was conquered by Jesus and his apostles, and it came to an end. But Satan is still active today. And even though his powers may work in a different way than they did in the days of Jesus Satan still has power today, and I would remind you of Ephesians chapter 6, beginning at verse 10. Listen to this. Ephesians 6, 10, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Why? That you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. The devil is still out there scheming, trying to tempt people into sin. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm, stand therefore, then says the text. That's Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to the first part of verse number 14. And so Satan is still at work today. Don't be deceived. But here's the question. What, what does God want us to learn from this? What is the greater story? And what, what are the lessons for us? I fear that sometimes we become consumed with questions about demons. And it's not wrong to ask questions. But a lot of questions we can't answer. But I'm afraid that we become consumed with questions about the demons and then we worry about the fate of these pigs that went down into the water and we miss the point. We miss the greater message that is found in this story. You see, the greater story is not about the demons, not about the pigs, but it's about the one who cast out the demons. So what do we think is the main lesson we learn from this account? Someone says, well, it's about the fact that the demons are real. Well, indeed, the demons are real. But ladies and gentlemen, that's not the main lesson for us from this story. Uh, someone says, well, it's about the failure of the people to follow Jesus. Now, remember, there were townsfolk here, uh, people in this city, right where this was all taking place. And, and they came out to see what had happened after the demons were cast out of these two men. And what did they do? 
You know, they should have recognized, okay, this is a miracle from God. There's no doubt they, they recognized something supernatural that happened when Jesus cast these demons out. But what did they do? The Bible says they were afraid and they begged Jesus to get out of there, to leave their region. Some people, when they begin to realize who Jesus is and the power that, that he has, they would rather have him gone than have his blessings because they're frightened. They're frightened by him. Someone might say, well, the real issue here is about the problem of the pigs. You know, uh, there are 20 questions that you can ask about the pigs and I won't have the answer to. I can suggest some answers about the problems. If this, if this swine herder, the man who possessed the pigs, if he was a Jew, <laughs> you know already what's happening here. That would have been unlawful. Leviticus chapter 11 made it clear that the swine were unclean animals. And so he would have been violating the law. But maybe the man was a Gentile. If you're a Jew or Gentile, there's one thing you need to remember that all of the animals, all the creatures of the earth. In fact, all the earth belongs to God and God can do as he wishes with anything that belongs to him. I'm reading from Psalm number 50. Listen to this. Psalm 50 in verse 10. Every beast of the forest is mine, says God. The cattle on a thousand hills, mine, says God. I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the field is mine. And so God can dispose of these things however he chooses. I think one thing you might see here is how little value God places on our possessions. Someone says, isn't it a shame? Isn't it awful what Jesus did? It's reprehensible. Jesus took someone's property and destroyed it. And people worry about those pigs. In fact, let me just... Let me just take a little side note here. Did you know that the skeptic, by that I mean the atheist or the agnostic, you know, he'll speak against Jesus for his destruction of these pigs. I'll tell you, a smart atheist knows to keep his mouth shut about the pigs. What do I mean by that? Well, if you make a charge, it's Jesus that he did something wrong, which is what a lot of people believe. Jesus did wrong in destroying these pigs. If you make that charge against Jesus, the charge won't stand unless the event actually happened. Ponder that for a moment. You see, those who speak against Jesus must, must agree that this is an actual factual account that Jesus cast the demons out. They went in the pigs and the pigs were destroyed. And the atheist comes along and says, isn't that a shame what Jesus did? But I like to ask the question, Mr. Atheist, Mr. Skeptic, I like to ask the question, are you willing to admit that Jesus actually cast out demons? Oh yes, that's what the Bible says. Wait a minute. If you say yes, you're in trouble. If you say yes, you've got to take the rest of what that text says. It proves that he's the son of God. You see, if he cast out the demons, it demonstrates something about who he is. Oh, no, no, he didn't cast them out. And so you want to say no now. You want to, you're going to change your answer. Well, if you say no, then why do you criticize Jesus over something you say he did not do? Make up your mind. It's either yes or no. And neither one works for you. Neither one works. I'll tell you, folks, I, when I was on the radio, when our radio program was active, we get questions about the pigs. And I, I'll tell you, I had questions come in about the pigs that I couldn't answer then. And maybe I can't answer today. But it doesn't change the fact that indeed it did happen. But God doesn't place as much value on our possessions as we place on our possessions. God has the right to do as he wills. But I'll tell you what you can learn from the pigs. You can learn that Satan is a destroyer. He just as soon destroy a herd of pigs as destroy two men. And that's what he did did in this case. 
whether pigs or people, Satan only seeks to destroy. And it's also worthy of note in this case that there appears to be no rejoicing over the two men who were liberated from demon possession. I mean, the people of the city, they come out, they see that these men are in their right mind. Everything is fine with them, sitting there clothed. They were naked before this, sitting there with clothes on and in their right mind and acting as decent citizens of the community would. But there doesn't seem to be any rejoicing. Instead, Jesus, please leave our territory. I think that's interesting in and of itself. Sometimes we just get our priorities wrong. Don't ever place pigs over people. We ought to rejoice when we read this story. Yeah, there are things that Max can't answer about the pigs. But we ought to rejoice that these two men were liberated from demon possession. We prefer people over pigs. We, we prefer people over the things that we might own, the things that we might possess. And that's as Jesus would have it to be. You know what Jesus did? Jesus brought peace to these two men who were so tormented by the demons. Not only did he bring peace to these two men, but brother, he brought peace to this community. Remember what we read in the, in the text in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 28? People couldn't even pass by because these demons were so violent. But now Jesus brought peace to the community by casting these demons out. Well, it's not about the problem of the pigs. What about Satan and his activities? There's a point to be made about that, but I don't think that's the main point by any means. Someone says, maybe, it's, maybe the real story here is about what Satan does to people's lives. And listen, think about these two men for a moment. These two men... They had family at some point, at least in life. They had moms and dads, may have had wives, may have had kids. We don't know the circumstances under which they were possessed by these demons, but now they were. And whatever they had, they were robbed of it. They, they were robbed of a, of a right mind. They were, they were robbed of their self-control. They were robbed of family. They were robbed of their homes. These men live in the tombs. And Satan took all that away from them. These men were hurting, hurting themselves, cutting themselves on the rocks and in the tombs. And Satan would fill them with fear and would condemn them to an eternity of judgment. And listen, even without demon possession... That's what Satan's doing today. Satan is a destroyer. He's destroying homes. He's filling people with fear and hurting people. You know, as, as bad as Satan is, the story here is not about the devil and his activities. Someone says maybe it's about helpless humanity. And I think there's a point to be made there because the people of this community, what can they do for these two guys? They banish them to the tombs. You live out there in the cemetery and we're going to chain you and put shackles on you. Because they have no power over these demons to do anything. But Jesus does. Jesus can do what the community cannot do. And I will tell you with the problems that men face today, even without demon possession, the problems that we have of addiction, of sin, wickedness, licentiousness, lasciviousness, all the problems we have today, the community cannot help you. Society cannot fix the problems that we're facing. Only Jesus. Jesus is the answer. And that really takes us to what the answer to this whole thing is. You see, the real issue here is not about the demons. It's not about the community. It's not about Satan. It's not about the pigs. This story and the lessons we draw are about Jesus. Jesus is the central character of the story. I told you Matthew 8 and 9 give us 10 consecutive miracles of Jesus. And he's the central character all the way through. It's not about the two men, but it's about Jesus. And it's about the identity of Jesus. You remember those men in the boat? Let me go back and look at that for just a moment. Those men in the boat Remember when they saw Jesus speak the word and the wind stopped 
and he spoke the word a second time, and the sea was calm, they said, who is this that even the wind and the waves and the sea obey his voice? Who is this? That's what they ask. Who can this be? And in the very next story, the demons answer and say, Son of God, that's who he is. They don't ask who. They know who. They understand because they had supernatural knowledge of Jesus. They don't have to ask who he is. And while the disciples were trying to figure out who Jesus was, these men, they understood it very well. They not only understood who he was, but they understood that he had authority to expel them and to cast them out. With one word, go, and they came out. We would do well to learn a lesson from the, de from the demons. The demons had no choice but to obey Jesus. We're given a choice, and we choose not to so much of the time. But that's the main lesson. The main lesson in this story is that Jesus is the Son of God. The demons believe Jesus is the Son of God. You're probably familiar with that passage in James chapter 2. James chapter 2 where it says, You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and what? Tremble. My translation says the demons believe and shudder. Why do they shudder? They shudder because they know that Jesus had the power to torment them, to cast them down to the abyss. They shudder because their belief is one of recognition. It's one of recognition, but not of acceptance. And that's the way it is with many people today. They recognize Jesus as the Son of God, but they refuse to accept him as Lord of their lives. I will tell you, my friends, it is no small thing to say, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If you've been scripturally baptized, you made a confession like that when you were baptized. If I acknowledge Jesus as God's Son in my mind, if I can say with my mouth what is the belief of my mind that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, I need to get that information away from my mind and to the rest of my body. I need to get it to my heart, to my hands, to my feet, and to my mouth. I need, to be, I need to speak of Jesus and tell others about Him. I need to walk in the ways of the Lord. I need to use my hands to serve Him. It's not enough to say, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. A lot of people recognize that, but they do not accept it. They do not accept Jesus as Lord of their life. And that's sad. It's a big deal to say Jesus is the Son of God. But it's not merely a matter of intellectual assent. It is a matter of allegiance. And so, what are Matthew 8 and 9 all about? It's about Jesus as the Son of God. That's why Matthew groups all these miracles together. He jams them together back to back to back, one after another after another, and says, look at this man's power. Some people ask, who is this? And it's the demons who answer, this is the Son of God. Matthew wants us to see that. That's what this section is about. And the disciples, they saw all these miracles. And their eventual admission that Jesus is God's Son meant their total allegiance to Him and their commitment to Jesus Christ for the rest of their lives. In our text... The demons say Jesus is the Son of God, and the disciples see it. But I want you to see it. God wants you to see that He is the Son of God. Jesus acts as only God can act. No one else can calm the sea and speak to the wind and make it stop. Jesus rules creation. But Jesus also judges evil, as we've seen in our study tonight. And Jesus saves those who will come to Him. The question is, have, has he saved you yet? You know, again, the demons had no choice but to obey. The demons had no choice but to obey God. You have a choice. So what will your choice be? Maybe there's someone here tonight that you recognize Jesus as the Son of God, but it's time for you to be baptized. Time for you to confess his name and be immersed into Christ for the remission of sins.
Jesus is God in the flesh. He is all that he claimed to be. These ten miracles demonstrate that he is what he says he is. You need to obey him tonight. Come now as we stand and sing. Come now, please.